Hi, everybody. This is Eitan and Peter. Uh, I hope you all can see us and hear us. Um, we are from Tetrade. We'd like to welcome you to this workshop, Istio 0 to 60. So uh, we'd like to welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Eitan Suez, and uh, my partner in crime is with me there, uh, Peter Yoshevitz. I hope I'm pronouncing your that's last name the, right. That's the best pronunciation ever. Ah, oh, super. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. And uh, I guess a little bit about us. We both work at a company called Tetrate, which is uh, its tagline is the enterprise service mesh company. Uh, we've been uh, working with service meshes from, from the very beginning. That is, uh, Tetrate was, was formed around um, service meshes from the beginning. And uh, we are both uh, involved in doing workshops and education and training for, for Tetrate. And so we'd like to welcome you to this workshop. Uh, and then what I would like to do is give you just a brief inform meta information about the workshop. Uh, the, the objective of the workshop is essentially to get you up and running very quickly with Istio. And we have about two and a half hours, uh, two and a half hours of time we've got. Uh, obviously that's uh, in some ways, both long and short. Uh, so it's not long enough to cover every nook and cranny of Istio. Istio is a technology that's matured over a period of time, but it's also long in terms of our attention span. So we'll try to take a 15 minute break uh, halfway through just to give people a chance to stretch their legs, to grab a cup of coffee, to get a bio break or what have you. And there is that Slack channel again. You see it there on the screen, istioslack.com and then istio.com workshop Tetrate. Uh, let me back up for a second. So uh, our expectations in terms of uh, what uh, we expect you to know is a basic understanding of, of the Linux command line and Kubernetes using the kubectl CLI and uh, of containerization and Docker and so on. And that's pretty much it. So we're going to start really from zero. And hopefully by the time uh, two and a half hours are up, you'll feel like you're at 60, right? That you uh, have a good sort of lay of the land. So this is a very broad journey across Istio and uh, not necessarily as deep one as you might be able to, to get uh, if you were to focus on a single subtopic. All right. Uh, so again, I'd like to welcome everyone and we're going to get started. So let me uh, orient you to where you're going to find the workshop materials. How is this workshop going to work? Uh, I, I like to call it lab driven training. Uh, we're going to try to keep your attention by forcing you to work, right? To do, to actually do certain activities, which I think makes it a whole lot more fun. Uh, we want to say, uh, don't hesitate to ask questions. I know this is webinar mode, so you can't really uh, you know, get on video and, and ask uh, with your microphone, but you could definitely ask on the Slack channel. So, um, and, and Peter and I are going to tandem. That is, I'm going to take the first section and uh, he's going to uh, be answering questions while I talk, and then we're going to swap. Then he's going to um, present the next topic and I will be supporting with questions. But we also definitely want your questions. Uh, you're by no means interrupting us. We're here for you. And uh, so hopefully you guys will have fun with this sort of mode of, uh, of doing the workshop. All right, so what are we gonna do? Uh, we're gonna first and foremost, make sure that everyone has got their environment set up. And so we have an environment lab that we're gonna do that's gonna bootstrap us into, uh, basically it's gonna give us our Kubernetes dial tone that we'll then uh, leverage to proceed to uh, install Istio and then explore Istio in a very proactive fashion. And we're going to sort of uh, weave into the labs the narrative. That is, we're gonna do presentations in between the labs. So it's gonna be almost like a ping pong. Uh, uh, we set up our environments and then we'll have, uh, Peter will, will give us an overview of the problems that Istio addresses. And then we'll do another lab, we'll install Istio, and then we'll talk about the architecture and design of Istio. And then we'll do another lab, we'll deploy some, some apps and talk about sidecar injection. And, and then we'll um, then go into another presentation and so on and so forth. Uh, and it gets really interesting once we've got um, everything installed, some kind of application, some kind of application installed and, and running, and then we can start looking at the different facets of, um, of our system, whether it's observability, security, or traffic shifting, uh, that uh, Istio makes uh, makes possible or makes easier. So that's that's what's on the agenda. 
And uh, along with our presentations, which I've posted to the Slack channel, by the way, a PDF copy of uh, these very slides are up on that Slack channel for you to download. We also have our workshop materials and uh, we'll, we'll also put that in Slack as well. And I'll go ahead and pop it up in another, in another tab and you could probably see it here on my screen. Uh, it's essentially a series of labs. If you look at the navigation bar on the left-hand side, we're going to follow these labs one after the other. We're going to do the lab environment, inst install Istio, an application under test. We're going to explore ingress and observability. So there's a lot to cover in the time we have. And so this is the URL for our course materials for the labs. All right, everyone with me so far? Let's carry on. All right, so if you're going to get started, uh, what uh, it's not a bad idea to go ahead and grab that URL, which uh, Peter has already put in the Slack channel, and just uh, bookmark it or open it in a separate tab so you have it. So let me brief you a little bit on environments. Uh, oftentimes, when we do these workshops, we do a, a BYOK. That stands for bring your own Kubernetes if possible. Uh, but if not possible, we have a fallback. And that is that we have, I, uh, Peter and I have provisioned a, a good number of uh, Kubernetes clusters that we can lend you for the duration of the workshop. And uh, it works pretty well. And we've got instructions that help you uh, with uh, the, the task of, of getting uh, to log in to that environment and accessing. And I'm going to demo it for you as well. So, so hopefully, by the time uh, we finish with that first bootstrapping lab, you'll be all set. Um, so we're going to begin with getting our environment set up. And uh, in order to do that, perfect. So I see some uh, folks on the channel have already asked a couple of questions. Is Minikube OK? Minikube should work fine. Um, and uh, I don't see why not. Uh, there might be, yeah. I think there are instructions on the Istio documentation about making sure how do you get your uh, ingress gateway IP address with Minikube. So if you're com com confident that you know how to get to that information, you should be OK with Minikube. But if not, uh, do just like uh, what uh, Thea Garajan just uh, asked, which is to ask request a, uh, a cluster and we'll give you a username and password. And I see that. Uh, yeah, people yeah. people are already DMing me. I told already. them to DM me. So I'll, I'll, okay, whoever DMs perfect. me, uh, we only have like a limited number of clusters. So DM me if we need it, I'll go through. Okay, and I will do the same thing too. Yeah. So, and I'll, uh, I'll, so far, I'll, see that I'm going to give you a, yeah, and I'm just pasting people the uh, uh, the email address that you can use and the password that you can use to log into GCP. Okay, well, uh, I much appreciate that, Peter. Uh, I'm going to start maybe demonstrating how uh, use how you're going to use those credentials essentially. So, uh, so without further ado, uh, let me go ahead and do just that. So there is a lab. So if you've got that URL that we just shared with you. Just click on that lab environment page. And uh, if we gave you a cluster, which I think is probably the best way to go, we've got plenty of clusters. So I think, I think we're gonna be okay in terms of, well, no, we've got a hundred people here. We've got about 30 clusters. So those of you who have your own cluster, uh, that's gonna help. Um, and uh, so what I'm gonna do is show you what I'm, uh, how I'm going to connect to uh, my cluster. Uh, the, the ones that we're provisioning for folks are in GKE. And uh, I'm simply going to follow a link. I'm going to go to my Google console. And I'm going to specifically use one of those accounts that I've uh, provisioned uh, the, uh, the, in the same manner than that we're handing to, to each of y'all. Uh, so uh, basically, the, there's a number of steps here. So if you're looking at my Google Cloud console, uh, and if you're looking at those instructions, there is a series of steps you're going to follow. The first one, obviously, is to log in to put in the username and password, and that's easy enough. Uh, the next step is to select your project. Uh, now, if you've already got your Kubernetes cluster up and running and ready, you probably don't need this. Just stick tight and, and uh, hang on while we get everybody else sort of hooked up. Uh, the next step is selecting your project, and that's uh, essentially in the in the top uh, ribbon or the, the banner at the top of the page is what we call this uh, project selector, which I'm hovering over right here. And the way that works is uh, oftentimes you want to look under the all tab. If there's an organization you have to choose, sometimes there's a pull down menu here that uh, requests that you select an organization. The organization is going to be Tetrate Labs. 
And uh, you'll see your project will show up on this list. So you'll just click on it and you'll see it sort of uh, displayed at the top. And if you have it displayed at the top, you know that your Kubernetes project, uh, sorry, your Google project has been selected. Uh, the next step is to look under Kubernetes engine and you'll see that we've already provisioned you a, uh, a cluster. So you see here, for example, there is a Kubernetes cluster listed. And in the uh, little three dot menu on the right hand side, there is this uh, pop up menu you can bring up and you can click on connect. And uh, essentially what you can do here is you can say run this in the cloud shell. And if you click on that button, then what you notice is happening right now is a a terminal opens at the bottom and I'm, I'm bringing it up, giving it a little bit more room. I'm going to make my font size a little larger so you can see. And, and that essentially copies and pastes a command into my cloud shell. And that command oftentimes has a side effect of bringing up an authorization prompt, which you'll just authorize. And, and what that does is run a gcloud command that configures your kubeconfig file. So that at this point, I have already kubectl installed. That's just by default with, with this cloud shell. And uh, my kubeconfig file is set. And I, there's a number of ways that I can verify. I can run uh, some token command like what I just did. Or you could do a kubectl config get context. And you can see that your context is set. Uh, so that's obviously our first order of business. And I'm going to walk you through these instructions, which we'd like you to follow. You log in uh, to whatever environment you have. You make sure you select the project that contains your Kubernetes cluster. Now, if you don't have a, a Kubernetes cluster running yet and, and we, we haven't given you one, uh, then you can go ahead and spin one up with a command like what we're showing here. This is a, a GCP one, but you could use another cloud provider just as easily. Um, and uh, the next step is to have a client environment. Uh, and in GCP, it's easy because, uh, and I know a lot of other clouds have it as well. You have a, some kind of cloud-based terminal, a web-based terminal like, like this. And once you've got that cloud shell open, it's just a matter of making sure you've got the kubectl CLI uh, installed, uh, which uh, is oftentimes there by default. And then uh, I'm just repeating what I just showed you, the fact that you need your kubeconfig pointing to your Kubernetes cl cluster, and we're ready to go. Uh, now, one last order of business is that for these labs, you'll need a few artifacts, and it's just a matter of copying and pasting this git clone command. So you can just clone a few YAML files, and I'm going to do the same thing myself here, run this git clone command. And the result of this command is going to be the presence of a new folder here called artifacts. And if you look in that folder, you'll see that there's a bunch of YAML files and those YAML files are part of the workshop. These are our resources that you're gonna be applying in subsequent labs. All right. All right, and that's it for the environment. Uh, there's a few other extra notes in here that uh, you might want to take, pay attention to. For example, adding to your bash RC, the convenience of aliasing kubectl as K, that's something I personally like to do very much. Um, and um, yeah, and that's it. And then uh, we should have our environment set up. We'll be ready to, to proceed with subsequent labs, such as installing Istio, which is going to come up next. All right. So uh, what we're going to do now is give you a couple of minutes to do just that, to get your bearings, to grab those credentials, to get to your Kubernetes cluster, and make sure that you could do a kubectl. Uh, get namespaces or get nodes and see that you you've got that dial tone and and you'll be ready to proceed all right so that's the the first lab that we're going to be performing i'll take over the first Ethan, all good with my screen yeah we see you all right, perfect. Okay, so I'll talk about the first part of uh, of this workshop where I basically introduce what the STO is uh, and what is the problem that STO is trying to solve. Now, one of the best ways that you can understand any systems and why the things are built the way they are built is just to understand that the problems that they were built to solve. And this is a critical context for the solution. So the problem statement that motivates Istio is the one that's shown on the slide. So IT is shifting to a modern distributed architecture. Uh, that shift has left the enterprises unable to monitor, connect, manage, and secure their services 
in uh, a consistent way. So as you take your legacy infrastructure, so those are monoliths or sometimes even services that um, are deployed into static environments, which are environments that don't change very much or very often. Uh, once you move those into modern architectures, you can run and you will run into a lot of problems. Now, the biggest thing behind this move to distributed architectures is the desire for developer velocity. Velocity. So what you want to do is you want your developers to be able to do more things and faster because that's what the business requires. So you want to decouple things from each other so they can move independently and go faster. Now, it all sounds great and it is great, but you run into problems. The tooling that we have today does not really uh, cope well with this new world where things are dynamic and communicate over the network. So there are the problems that we need to figure out. How do we go about monitoring, connecting, managing, and securing the services in a consistent way? So when I say distributed architectures, what do I mean by that? So when I'm talking about that, what I mean is services, uh, service-based architecture, they're probably in containers that are deployed into more dynamic environments that you traditionally deal with. So if we think of Kubernetes, uh, pods come and go, they change IP addresses, uh, they change ports dynamically, and that happens all the time, right? And this is in direct contrast to some of the, uh, let's say, VM-based systems where we deploy the VM, we have a persistent IP address, and that VM runs one application for years. Now, maybe the most important difference is in the increased importance of the network. So as we break these monoliths into separate smaller pieces, those separate pieces get composed over the network. So you have to deal with the network in places you never had to deal before. Now, if, if, if I use a single buzzword to describe all this, all these types of services, these are microservices. So what Istio was built for, it was built to solve these problems. It helps us to monitor, connect, manage, and secure services in a consistent way. So let's break down the problem into uh, um, sub problems and go into a little bit of more details and I'll start with monitoring. So when we're talking about monitoring services, we really mean uh, getting some visibility into the state of our dynamic system. So we need to be able to understand what's actually happening in the systems. There are three key ways you can do that. Uh, you generate the metrics about your services. So as the requests come in uh, and they go out, what you want to do is you want to publish the metrics that then some other systems uh, can consume and give you this summary of that. So uh, things like how many 500s, how many 200s, how many 400s, and so on. You also want detailed logs. So those metrics uh, give you a great view of the front door. So stuff that goes in and stuff that goes out. However, these metrics don't really give you a lot of insights about what's actually happening. And that's where traditionally you use logging to, uh, logging to fill, uh, fill in those gaps. Finally, tracing, which is the newest of the three from the perspective of the monitoring systems we're building, uh, tracing, uh, you can think of tracing like logs on steroids, right? So rather than just printing some statement, statements as we go through uh, um, uh, the, the services, what we can do is we can annotate the request that traverses not just through services that I know I own or I write, but if your system is set up correctly, you can also propagate these services through your entire system through the entire set of services. So what you can get is for a single request that comes into the front door, you know exactly which services it went through. And as it goes through those services, you can attach additional metadata uh, to that trace. And this is very uh, powerful. So the next thing, uh, what we want to do is we want to connect the services together. Uh, 
I bet there's a lot of people who've uh, implemented retries with a for loop in your applications, right? Now, the question is how many of you implemented this correctly every time uh, without a bug and then perhaps cause, cause an outage or something like that? Because bugs in code like, uh, uh, like this, um, they can uh, fairly easy, what you can do if something goes wrong is you can easily DDoS your internal infrastructure with this, specifically with the retries, right? And this is the problem, right? So if we look at when we first started to build programs that were communicating with each other, we had a, there was a set of problems that we had to solve. We had to solve uh, naming, we had to solve delivery, right? We had to make sure that the other end actually got the message we sent. We had congestion control to not overwhelm the other server. And we had to do all these things. And we saw these things start to be repeated in applications that need to communicate to each other. And we eventually extracted that out into what we call the OCI network model. So this is the interface we think about and interact uh, with the network today. Now, as soon as we had the nice model that handled a lot of that complexity around naming, retries, congestion control, and delivery, we immediately started rebuilding the same logic again in our applications, but at a higher level. So this is where your retry loop is uh, like rate limiting. That's just congestion control. Service discovery is naming. It's exactly the same principles we have and that we've solved at L4 and below, they pop up again at L7. So what service mesh does, or one of the goals of the service mesh is to push these networking abstractions below the line. Uh, so the applications don't really need to think about that. Now, and there's a bunch of things that come into that as well. Things like I mentioned service discovery, um, automatic resiliency, retries, circuit breaking, uh, and all these other things that make your system settle into a steady state that's healthier than it might otherwise be. Now, a key here or a key piece here is uh, load balancing. And particularly, if we can enable the client side load balancing, uh, we can do then some fancy things with point to point communication without actually having to go through the intermediaries without introducing more points of failure. So once we have all these services uh, and they're deployed everywhere, uh, the other problem that we face is, so when we had a monolith, there were only a, let's say a couple of ports the application was listening on and then all the communication was mostly internal. So the request would come in, uh, monolith would do its computation, right? And it would just spit out some answer. Right. So when you would have to secure something like that, it was relatively simple. Right. So you could lock down um, any port that's not that's not the one that you need. And then you can start applying some um, uh, IP rules to control who can communicate with the monolith and who cannot. And that is great in the static model. But when your IP changes a lot, this traditional model, model of uh, network security doesn't work anymore. So instead, what we really like is a fine grain control on who can talk to whom, so service to service communication. And within that, I would like to say for specific requests, whether they're allowed or not, whether it can route, uh, uh, it, whether if the request can be routed to one instance or another. So we want to do, we want to be able to do fine grain control over where and how traffic flows and what traffic is and which traffic is not allowed. So finally, what we wanna do, we wanna secure these things, right? So management and security, uh, two, uh, these two go hand in hand. Uh, today, the security primitive is uh, the identity. Uh, the security primitive is the identity primitive that's used the most often. It's the IP and the port pair. Right? Uh, port pair. Um, however, as I mentioned, it doesn't really translate well into the dynamic world. So the idea, the idea, what the idea is that what we'd like to do is we'd like to issue the identities to the workloads themselves. And before we issue that identity, we also want to make sure that um, the environment in which that workload is executing is appropriate and that the workload itself is good, right? So we don't want the developers. Um, let's say building something on their laptops, 
deploying it to production and then getting production identity, right? Um, it is the wrong binary. It is the right environment, but it's not a vetted workload that uh, went through your uh, build system. And then conversely, you don't want the developers to uh, take a production binary and run that on their laptop and get a production identity. So you can have a right binary, but you can have a wrong environment. So if you can verify those two things, if you can authenticate the environment, then you can also authorize the issuance of um, identities, and then you can use that identity at runtime for, uh, for your policies. And we'll talk about this in the uh, security section, and we have labs around this as well. So all of these areas uh, uh, is uh, all these areas are touched by uh, service mesh, and service mesh does provide features for those areas. Now, one of the coolest things about mesh is also the way it centralizes control. So before all of these features that I talked about, uh, you could have them implemented in a, let's say a client library, right? So Twitter is very famous for having done this in the Finagle uh, library and original Linkerd wrapped that in a binary as well. And this is a tried and true thing. Uh, Google also did the same thing with client set of libraries that handled all of these network, uh, networking concerns, I guess. Now, the problem with this approach is in updates, right? So you have to go to individual app teams and say, hey, uh, rebuild and redeploy your binary so you can pick up this new version of the SDK. Then you have to start doing coordination because some teams uh, update their binary slower than the others. And then you might have some incompatibility and in versions. And there's like a slew of problems that uh, uh, that can be surfaced by this. Now, these systems traditionally did not really allow any form of centralized control, right? So you could not go and for example, affect the retry policy of all the callers to a service, even if they were calling through the same SDK. So what Service Mesh does is it centralizes this control and it empowers a small group of people in the organization to be responsible for a huge amount of operational expense. For example, a central metrics team that's responsible for metrics ingestion, collection, and presentation for the entire org, they can operate that part of the mesh. Uh, they can affect changes across the entire org just through some configuration pushes, and that can be independent from other teams, right? Uh, they can also offer dashboards to other teams to uh, see their services. And then you can do the same for security and traffic management. So you can move control out of the individual team and into these centralized groups. Now the other, Aiton? Oh, yeah, sorry. sorry. Oh, okay, you're <laughs> talking to talking to yourself. <laughs> sorry, I'm mute myself. <laughs> oh, that's fine. No, no, it's fine. I wasn't sure if I missed something. Uh, mm. So the other benefit uh, is because you have that centralized control or those teams have the centralized control, they can also delegate that control and then give it back to uh, individual teams for things that shouldn't be managed by a central team. For example, uh, a central team is not going to set retry policies and timeouts for every individual service, right? That's something that service owners need to own and set for themselves. And then a centralized team can delegate that. Now, finally, when uh, you need to affect change in the system, you need to be able to do it quickly, right? So you need to be able to respond to dynamic environments uh, and typically just pushing new binaries, like fixing a bug, pushing a binary, uh, it's typically too slow, right? So if your configuration is encoded in the binary, you need to do a whole new rollout to do a change. And typically that's not uh, fast enough. So you should be able to push your configuration uh, instead to affect any change and not really push binaries. Then uh, once you have that, then you can do uh, really nice things like uh, you can treat your uh, config the same way you treat your binaries. You can do progressive rollouts. You can do continuous deployments and all of those things. So to summarize this section, what is Istio? Uh, uh, Istio is a platform to monitor, secure, connect, and manage your services consistently. All right, so let's go to, I guess, the second lab. I'm going to call it the second lab. All right, so um, 
I have my cluster set up as well. So if I list my pods, assuming everyone, oh my, I can list everything. Uh, everyone can, everyone should be at this state right now. Uh, so we have an empty cluster. So what I'll do next is uh, I'll go through the uh, install Istio portion of the lab. Um, so the first thing that I'll do is I will download Istio 113.2. So you can do that by explicitly setting the Istio version here. If you don't specify this, you'll just get the latest uh, uh, Istio version. So this gets downloaded into Istio 1.13.2 folder. So there's a bin manifest samples tools folder. And the next step uh, in, in the lab is telling you how to add Istio CTL to your path. Uh, so it explains you can create a bin folder, you can copy the Istio CTL binary there, then you, you can go ahead and modify your bash RC file, or if you're Windows, probably modify, uh, uh, I get environment variables, path environment variable or something like that. It's been a while since I used uh, Windows. So since I'm on um, Cloud Shell and Cloud Shell does have Istio installed. However, it's 1.8.0. So what I'll do is I typically just copy the Istio CTL binary. I copy it to user local bin folder. Uh, and this will just overwrite it. So if I run it again, Istio CTL version, you'll notice I have 113.2. Uh, the reason that I'm not creating the bin folder and updating my uh, bash RC is because I have my own setup there already. But um, if you're uh, if you're using uh, one of the accounts that we give you, feel free to do that. Feel free to do that. The end result should be you should be able to run Istio CTL version, and you should see 1.13.2 version. All right, so next step, once we have Istio CLI installed is we can use Istio CTL binary with the install command to go and install Istio. Now, the prompt will tell you that this will install Istio 1.13.2 with a default profile that includes Istio core, Istio D in, and ingress gateways, right? And includes those components. Now in, uh, there's other, profiles that you can use installation profiles and let me open the let me open that link just to show you so this is a fairly useful table here that explains what's included which core components are included in uh in the profile so since we're just using default we'll get the ingress gateway and we get the stod sometimes you want to install demo that one includes the seo egress gateway or if you want to fully control stuff or just have the control plane, you would just do minimal. Uh, and there's a couple of here, like external and empty uh, uh, profiles that you can use. And these are typically used if you're uh, setting up multi-clusters or if you're, uh, I think it's multi-clusters mostly or empty if you want to like fully customize uh, how you want to install your mesh. So STO CTL installed, uh, we get prompted for it. We can just type Y, confirm, and then this will go ahead and it will install STO. Now, if you wanna, uh, uh, I guess for automation purposes, what you could do is you could also do, I think it's dash Y. So if you do STO CTL install dash Y, it's gonna automatically proceed with an installation. You can set the profile with the dash dash set profile equals uh, flag to the STF CTL command. Um, and that's all for the installation. What's happening right now is internally Istio is creating an Istio operator resource, and then it's actually installing uh, Istio in the cluster. So this might take a couple of seconds. Uh, if there's any questions while we're waiting for this, feel free to ask. So it looks like it's already done. So let's see uh, what happens. So I'll just list the namespaces. And you'll notice we got this Istio dash system namespace. This is the default namespace where Istio gets installed. And we can also verify and list the pods to make sure that we have two pods running in Istio system. One is the ingress gateway and the other one is Istio D, which is the control plane of the SDS service mesh. Finally, 
if we run Istio CTL version again, you will notice that this time it actually shows us the client version. It shows us the control plane version as well as the data plane version and that we have one proxy. And this one proxy is the Istio Ingress gateway. All right, so at this point, I'll uh, hand it over to Aten and Aten will continue with the next section. Thank you, Peter. All right, guys. So uh, basically what we've done is uh, sort of uh, open the gates and uh, asking everyone to proceed uh, now that you've got your environment and do essentially that install lab that Peter just demonstrated. Um, and the objective is to make sure that you've got Istio installed. And this is where I'll be picking up from. All right, so uh, where I like to begin is where Peter ended. Uh, I also re just ran through this lab right now, as you can see uh, on my screen, my terminal here, I've got, I just installed Istio. Uh, so let's, let's go through this together. I'll make my phone size a little bit larger. So, um, Notice that Istio 1.13.2 uh, release has been uh, downloaded to my machine. And I also have Istio Cuddle version 1.13.2 uh, moved over to my path. Uh, but the thing I want you to notice is if you look at your namespaces now, you'll notice Istio system is a new namespace that wasn't there before, right? And if you take a peek in there, if you look at the pods, for example, in Istio system, you will see essentially, I think Peter mentioned that uh, when the default profile is it's actually called default, it installs Istio D and the Istio ingress gateway. And we'll have more to say about each of these in a subsequent lab. As a matter of fact, my presentation is going to begin answering the question, well, what is Istio D? Uh, you know, the, well, obviously we've installed Istio, but what role does it play in the larger architecture? All right, so if you've got uh, Istio uh, installed, uh, you're with us, uh, and all of the instructions are right here in that second lab. So having uh, done that, the next thing to do is, and I'm going to fast forward through to the next presentation on the Istio architecture. All right, so let's talk about Istio architecture. Uh, we've got a Kubernetes cluster. We've got Istio installed. And uh, we're talking about, obviously, uh, the subject is distributed applications, distributed systems. And you could think of this diagram here that I'm showing on the screen as the fundamental building block for any distributed system, right? A distributed system is made up of multiple services talking to each other in different configurations, what have you. And so it, it behooves us to study this building block, right? It's almost like the Lego block that you use to construct more complicated um, sort of uh, situations or setups, multiple services. I think uh, in, in the, if you were listening to Eric Brewer this morning, he was talking about how uh, a few years back they had 100,000 of these services out there. And today the number keeps growing every, with time that number seems to always tend to increase. Uh, all right, so when service A tries to call service B, uh, how does this work in Istio? What's interesting is this problem is a problem that we've tried to solve many, many times before, oftentimes through libraries that you sort of, or dependencies that you add to every service. For example, I know a Spring Boot comes to mind. I used to be a, uh, a deep knee deep in the Java and Spring community, and they've got libraries to help you with making calls to other services. With Istio, this works differently. It works with an out of process uh, sort of a solution. Right? The idea that you can, alongside a service, uh, tack along with it what we call a sidecar, right? An Envoy sidecar. Envoy is. Uh, uh, is its own uh, in its own right a project and voiproxy.io is the is the URL. So if you want to get really deep with Envoy, you can go and start mining the documentation on Envoy proxy. But Envoy is a proxy, a uh, proxy server, very much in the vein that Nginx and HA proxy and other proxies uh, sort of uh, play a role in proxying requests to other services. And here we see it deployed in a fashion that's maybe uh, up until service meshes was maybe perhaps novel, this idea to give, to give every service some kind of sidecar that can proxy requests. And along with that proxy is also a policy. So in Kubernetes, when you deploy a workload, it's in a pod, it runs in a pod, and the pod itself can be configured, and it, indeed it is, by Istio, in such a way 
that all traffic in and out of every pod is intercepted and redirected through that sidecar without you having to you by you I mean the developer having to do anything to reconfigure their application in order to make that work. That's sort of out of the box, transparently configured in such a fashion, uh, which in a sense is rather convenient, right? There's no leakage of extra concern that a developer needs to somehow uh, adapt to in order to make their applications work. So uh, the developer teams are still uh, working in the same way they have before, but we've got these sidecars. And the, the other piece of the puzzle, so to speak, is this sort of, sometimes I call Istio D this guardian angel or you know the, the master orchestrator, right? That is actually aware there is Istio D running. We just saw it in the Istio system namespace. And it's listening, it's aware of anything that gets deployed, deployed to your service mesh. So when service A and service B were deployed, uh, Istio D made a note of that and it built itself its own little service registry. And so service discovery, service registry is something Istio can handle. Now, unlike many other solutions where the, your services have to be aware of the presence of a registry, here it's the other way around. It's almost like uh, an inversion of control of sorts where, whereby the, uh, the information that these sidecars need to know in order to do their job of sending requests, outbound requests or receiving inbound requests and routing those requests to the right location, uh, is actually conveyed to them by Istio. So Istio knows the lay of the land. Uh, you, you could think of, you know, if you're familiar with Kubernetes and the fact that, you know, you can watch in Kubernetes for all kinds of things happening, for example, the creation of a workload or what have you. Uh, you've got this component in Istio called Galley, which builds up a configuration um, of your service mesh which is a picture of the world, right? And every time something changes in that picture, uh, that configuration will get updated. So uh, another component called Pilot takes that configuration and is in charge of distributing the configuration to all the envoys. So you can think of those sidecars as being uh, really like a blank slate. When they're first deployed, they don't know anything. And it's not their responsibility to, it's Istio's responsibility to know the lay of the service mesh, what the IP addresses for all the endpoints for service B and service C are, and then to build an Envoy configuration and distribute it to, to service A's sidecar and to the, all the other sidecar and say, hey, you, Envoy, you should know that there is a service B out there. And so uh, you could think of STOD instrumenting your Envoys. Now it goes even further than just configuring, uh, you know, IP addresses and and uh, outbound uh, endpoint destinations. Uh, you can, uh, well, Pilot distributes policies as well. So policies help envoys know what's allowed and what's not allowed. This could be security policies. It could be other policies in terms of how you know what load balancing strategies we want to use. Um, uh, and these policies can be enforced. So when a request come, goes from A to B. Uh, that policy can actually determine whether that a request can be denied. And then in addition, and this, this goes right back to the keynote this morning. Uh, well, it was this morning for me. It might have been a different time for you, depending on where you are geographically. Uh, it's this whole notion of, of workload identity. The fact that there's a component in Istio called Citadel, which plays a role in distributing and rotating X509 certificates that leverage a framework called Spiffy. So if you've never heard of Spiffy, uh, you can go and find out more about Spiffy at spiffy.io. Uh, and it's, it's called a secure production identity framework. And, and the reason that it has that name is because it's in charge of conveying identity to each service. So each workload knows, uh, has an identity and that identity is communicated in every sort of uh, communication um, uh, that uh, takes place inside your mesh. All right, so armed with all of that information, configuration policy and workload identity, uh, which also enables mutual TLS, which also in, ensures encryption of that traffic, uh, we have an environment in which your communication is rather secure and in which you can really um, build a foundation for a cloud native architecture, right? Because uh, you can horizontally scale all your services in any which way you want. And it's those envoys that take on themselves the burden of routing requests to the right destination, load balancing requests, and so on and so forth. So very, very powerful sort of um, 
design that enables a foundation for running distributed systems in a secure and scalable and cloud native way. All right, so if we were to now actually trace a sample request in our minds, so to speak, or visually through this illustration, the way this actually works, when A tries to make a call to B, because maybe there's some kind of dependency, maybe it needs to request some information from that service, uh, that request will get intercepted by its local envoy. And it's that envoy that's really in charge of figuring out how to route that request to B. And so there may be multiple instances of B. Mm -hmm. You have client-side load balancing taking place there. Uh, and uh, that envoy knows the IP address of all the endpoints of B as well. So it knows how to route that request because it has that configuration that was given to it by STOD. And, and by the way, if you were to ask the question, you know, what happens if a service C gets introduced into my mesh right now, STOD will dynamically uh, react to that event and push an updated configuration to all of those envoys, uh, which is a rather powerful thing. So the state of our mesh is always kept up to date. All right, so uh, another thing that happens when that envoy sends that request over to B is the fact that workload identity allows B to enforce um, Again, there's a policy, but also to identify, to recognize that request came from A, for example, and not some imposter. Okay, so that's the security baked in, so to speak. And vice versa, right? That is, uh, A knows that it's talking to B and not some imposter as well. So, so those certificates uh, play their role. That spiffy identity plays its role of ensuring that we're, the right parties are involved in the communication. So if you think of you know, TLS and, uh, and mutual TLS, it's just a bi-directional uh, version of TLS, whereby both parties identify themselves to the other. All right, so then the policy kicks in, right? And B says, okay, does my policy say that I'm allowed to receive requests from A, right? Under what conditions? Or maybe there might be something in the headers that, that might actually be a condition that might determine whether that request is allowed. So that's also a very powerful feature. And then finally, assuming that policy allows that request, the request is forwarded to the service proper, which then handles the, the request uh, according to its business logic. And then the response also travels back to A through those sidecars. All right, so that's, that's the uh, picture that I wanted to uh, relate to you, because as we're about to deploy an application to our mesh, we're going to ask ourselves those questions. Well, how does that envoy get in there? Do I have to be in, you know, in charge of making sure that that envoy gets deployed? I have to modify my deployment manifests and so on and so forth. And, and the answer is no, you don't have to worry about it. And we'll show you how this works. There's two mechanisms. Um, there's one called the manual sidecar injection. The term is called sidecar injection. And then there's automatic sidecar injection, which will do it for you automatically. Now, a couple of terms that this slide sort of brings to the fore is the fact that STOD itself is uh, what we call a control plane API, right? It's behind, it works behind the scenes. It makes sure that all those envoys are configured properly, but it does not play an active role in requests that are going across your mesh at runtime between services. Those are all handled by the envoys. So that's called the data plane, and then STO lives in the control plane. All right, so uh, I see a Q&A yeah, question it, there. Uh, I was gonna mention that uh, we have a question from Kartik. Yes. Um, if I do not want to allow service A to connect to service C, does ISTE allow me to do that or should I rely on network policies? Yes, Istio does allow you to do that. And as a matter of fact, our security lab is gonna show you how. So stay tuned, but yeah. Yeah, so the, yeah, you can you can prevent it, prevent it, but you can also say I just don't want to uh, uh, publish the configuration for that service at all. Meaning, Envoy will be able to like you will be able to make calls to it, but you won't like Envoy will know or Mesh will know nothing about that service, right? So there's two levels. You can yes, you can prevent it, and you can do uh, 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 you can just make it unknown to the Mesh, I guess. So there's another question that says how application knows how to send outbound traffic through the Envoy. Uh, so when the STO, uh, when the Envoy proxy gets injected, there's also an init container that gets injected and runs before any of the two containers start up, two containers being the Envoy proxy and your actual application. So in that init container, there's an elaborate uh, um, 
uh, IP rules section that gets set up. So there's a set of IP rules that get configured that define uh, anything that hits the pod, how the traffic is being intercepted and how it gets routed either on the way in or on the way out. Um, I hope that answers the question. Um, yeah, and it all becomes a lot clearer once we start doing it. Um, yeah, so, so there, there's also a question about uh, Istio Galley. So what Galley does is basically gives you a way to uh, like validate the configuration before it actually gets sent and applied. Um, but it's all it's all part of one um, one binary, I guess. Like historically, this used to be like three or four. Uh, separate components that were running in a SEO system, but then it, everything got merged into uh, into one. Okay, and I see another question there uh, about how service discovery works in SEO. Uh, we will uh, we will answer that question also in due time. I want to run through uh, the the next lab, which I think uh, everyone should probably um, at some point also start working on, where we're going to deploy an application to our mesh. So if we look at the state of the world right now, uh, what do we have? We've got our namespaces. We've got Istio installed. You could type Istio cuddle version, by the way. And, uh, and notice that the output from that command tells you that not only is your client installed, but that the control plane and data plane are also with Istio. So that's, that's also an indication that Istio is installed. But if we look at the pods in our namespaces, uh, in the default namespace, we don't have anything going on. Oops. And, uh, and so it's high time that we deploy an application. And so the application we're going to deploy is actually found in that artifacts folder that uh, that you've downloaded. So let me go ahead and, and grab my, my copy of that as well. I don't think I, I grabbed it yet. So that's at the very bottom here. Yeah, I'm going to do my git clone. So in your artifacts folder, you will notice uh, a couple of files that we're going to focus on. One is customers.yaml, and the other one is webfrontend.yaml. There are two services. We kept it very, very simple on purpose. And if you look at any one of them, so artifacts, customers, .yaml, uh, it's what you would expect as a uh, Kubernetes uh, developer or operator. There's a service account. There's a deployment manifest, which references the container image for the customer service, and then a cluster IP service for the customer service, which is also called customers. So, uh, but the question is, well, where, where's the sidecar, right? And it's not there, obviously. And there are two ways to really deal with, with injecting a sidecar. There's what's called um, a sidecar injection. And if you're uh, curious to look at the documentation, you'll see that the documentation page in Istio proper talks about manual injection and automatic sidecar injection. And maybe the best way to understand how this works is by looking at that manual injection command real quick. If you do an Istio cuddle, there's a command called cube inject. And if you pass in that manifest file, it'll actually spit out a modified manifest containing the sidecar. So if I maybe pipe that through, uh, I don't know, less for example, notice that my deployment manifest is not changed. It doesn't just contain, it shouldn't just contain a single container, it should have two containers. And if I, if I look under the containers section there, uh, you'll see that there are two entries. And the second entry, which has lots of environment variables <laughs> defined, is the Envoy. And uh, the name of it is Istio-Proxy. You see it there in the middle of the screen. So that's the Envoy sidecar. So I could technically grab the output from this command and apply it to my Kubernetes cluster, but there's a better way. And the better way is what's called automatic sidecar injection. And, and the way that works is by labeling. If you label your namespace, your default namespace, whichever namespace to which you want to deploy your application, in this case, it would be the default namespace, with a special label called Istio injection equals enabled, OK? And we can, we can look at our labels. There we go. Istio injection is enabled on the default namespace. That's essentially a marker that allows a mutating webhook admission controller to do the exact same thing that Istio cuddle cube inject does for you. So if you do uh, a Kubernetes cube cuddle get mutating webhook configurations, you'll see that there is actually something called an Istio sidecar injector that was installed as part of Istio. And that's its job is to inject those sidecars. So if we just do a k apply dash f artifact customers.yaml, and we'll do it also for the other microservice, which is the web front end.yaml. Uh, the thing that you'll notice if you look at your pods is that the ready column shows 
two pods, the two, two uh, containers inside each pod. And, uh, and we see that uh, they're slowly coming up and uh, the pod is initializing and so on. So a couple of things happen there, as, as Peter mentioned, there's an init container that runs first that uses a some IP tables mechanism to, to reconfigure the pod so that all requests in and out go through that envoy. And then there's the sidecar injector that ensures that uh, uh, your manifest has the second container and the second container is that envoy proxy. Now, the other thing that happens is behind the scenes is just like the presentation we did, Istio D sent configurations to both of those envoys. So those envoys are configured and they know each other's, um, uh, they, they know about the presence of the other services is what I'm trying to say. There's, there is a diagnostic command called Istio cuddle proxy status that gives you a little bit of a view into that service registry. I know there was a question about service discovery and it happens in a rather beautiful way through this inversion of control. So what you see here is three entries. Uh, you would expect two, right? One for the web front end, one for customers. The third one's for an ingress gateway. We'll save that for the next, uh, for the next lab. So if you've deployed your application, uh, just like I did now, okay, get pod. If we look at customers and web front end are deployed, we're essentially done. Uh, maybe the last thing we want to do is verify that those applications really are working. And so to do that, you're going to apply another artifact called sleep. Sleep is one of those simple standard samples that come with STO that is just a container with a curl uh, binary uh, built into that image. So we can use curl commands to call other services from inside the cluster. So if you do a kubectl exec, and that's by the way, all in the lab instructions, right? If you look at the lab instructions, it'll show you how to do what I'm about to show you. Uh, so if we execute from the sleep pod, curl command to the customer's endpoint, we should get back some JSON. Okay, so we now we know that the customer service basically is in charge of returning customers to some other service, the web front end service primarily. And then we can do the same thing from the sleep container, we can call the web front end uh, and that should return HTML. I'm gonna uh, filter some of that output so I don't show you the whole page so we don't have a ton of HTML scrolling through my page. So if you've done that command, you know that those app your application is deployed and running. And, and we're all good and we're done with the lab. That's all this lab was about, just deploying an application so that we can now begin to explore Istio. And uh, Peter is gonna take it from there and he's going to talk to you about Ingress, how Ingress works in Istio and how to configure Ingress so we can expose our application to, to, uh, to end users. All right. Um, to remember to stop sharing. Yes. Yes. Oh, actually, because I have, I'm a, I have co-host privileges. I could you can steal it from me, right? steal it from you, <laughs> yeah, and just share it over. Uh, all right, so let me. Th there's only a couple of slides here. Uh, uh, we're gonna talk about just briefly about Ingress. Um, so previously, Aten had like service A and service B, and they're calling to each other, right? Now, um, typically, you also want, in most cases or majority of cases you want to expose your applications to the public, right? You want, you want to have hello.com or whatever.com domain name that's hooked up and it wants, you want that to render your web page, your service, um, et cetera, right? So in that case, the scenario that you have is you have a load balancer, an actual load balancer instance. The way that we get this in uh, Kubernetes is by deploying a service with a load balancer type. And when we deployed Istio, uh, what happened, the Istio ingress gateway, there's a service for it. And that service is off load balancer type. So you automatically get a, an actual load balancer, an actual external IP address, right? So the next thing that you typically do, you would take that IP address, you would go to your name.com, godaddy.com, whatever your uh, uh, domain registrar of choice is, you would take the, that external IP address and you would say, hey, I want, whenever someone types in hello.com, I want that uh, name to resolve to that IP address, right? So once that happens, you are quarter way there, right? Uh, you type hello.com, the name gets resolved to an IP address, which is the ingress gateways, which is hitting the ingress gateway, which is just an instance of 
uh, an envoy. And then from there, you can route to any services you want. Now, there's a lot of things missing here, right? Because you have to tell this Ingress gateway, this instance of the envoy proxy, what to listen for, and then later on where to route the traffic to. But in the end, it's just, you have an envoy proxy that's calling another envoy proxy that will probably call another envoy proxy later on. That's the typical thing that you have. So what can we say shortly about Ingress? So the pod runs in the SEO system namespace. I'll show that in the lab. To configure this instance of the Envoy proxy, we use the gateway resource. So gateway custom resource that's deployed when you deploy Istio. However, with that gateway resource, what you're saying is you're just telling the gate, uh, the Ingress gateway to listen. You're telling it, hey, listen on this board for this name. Right? That's what you're telling it to do, nothing else. The actual routing where you tell where the traffic should go, that's done with a separate, a separate resource called virtual service. All right, so let's go to the Ingress lab and I have it, let me just open it here. So everyone knows what we're going through, the lab that we're going through. So this is the lab that we'll go through. You should be at the point where you have the, customers v1 application running, you have the web front and application running, and you're able to access, you were able to curl, to send a curl from that sleep pod to uh, both of those services. So before we go and deploy anything, let's just look at the pods again in the Istio system namespace. So we have STOD, that's our control plane, but we also have this pod called Istio Ingress Gateway. Now I've mentioned that when this is deployed, there's an Istio Ingress Gateway Kubernetes service that gets deployed. So if we list the services in the Istio system namespace, you'll notice that we have this Istio dash Ingress Gateway service that's of type load balancer. And that gives you the actual external IP address, right? So what you could do is you could say curl and just curl to this IP address. Of course, you'll get connection refused because you haven't configured it at all. So in the lab, there's this command. I'll just copy paste it and I'll just tell you what it does, right? It just sets the gateway IP uh, environment variable to point to our IP address. So if I do this, let me just show you gateway IP. And this is just to make it easier so I don't have to list the thing again and then copy paste it again. It's just, it just stores that external IP uh, address for you. Uh, you'll have a different IP address, but uh, that's an easy way that you can just get access to it. All right, so as I mentioned, configuring the ingress, there's two parts to it. The first one is defining the gateway uh, resource. And that's the one where we're gonna specify the port, the host and the protocols we wanna listen for. And then the second part will be defining how we want to route the traffic that hits that uh, a gateway ingress, the, the ingress controller, how do you wanna route it? And the way to do that is with the virtual service resource. So let's look at this gateway.yaml file and I'll just do it this way. So this is the way that, this is how this gateway resource looks like. So we're calling the gateway resource front end dash gateway. Uh, the selector section here, what this is saying is, hey, this gateway resource is for a pod that has this label set. So we're selecting a pod, which in our case is gonna be that Istio Ingress gateway pod that's running in Istio system namespace. And we can show that. So if I do get pods, SEO system, that's just show labels. You'll notice that this SEO ingress gateway has this, uh, where is it? SEO equals ingress gateway label set, right? So we're just saying the gateway resource that we're gonna create, uh, it's configuring that instance, right? It's configuring that instance of the ingress gateway. Why is it done this way? Because you can have more than one ingress gateways running. You're not limited to only one, right? So you can have more, and this is the way that you distinguish it. Now, the second section, uh, section is the service board, uh, servers uh, portion, where you can multi uh, define multiple servers. And servers is just an instance of the host you wanna listen to and the port that you wanna listen for 
as well as the protocol and the name. So what we're saying here is we want this ingress gateway to listen on port 80 for any host that comes in, right? And I'll explain this a little bit later what this actually means. So let's deploy this one. So we've created the front end gateway. So that was the first portion. So now if I do, remember previously when I curled uh, to the gateway uh, IP, I got the connection refused. Notice I actually get a different response now. I get a 404. Oh, and just clear the screen like this and do it again. So I get a 404, which is just saying, hey, this doesn't exist. There's nothing behind it, right? Uh, also, another hint here is this uh, response header that was set, uh, server colon istio dash envoy, which is just telling us the request did went through our ingress gateway um, that we have running, the istio ingress gateway. So we have that. The next step is we actually have to tell uh, uh, where we want to route the traffic to. So the way to do this is using a virtual service resource. So let's look at the virtual service resource that we'll deploy. And by the way, what we want to do is we want to route the traffic to this web front end uh, uh, pod that's running inside the cluster. So let's do that. Go, oops, that's... Copy this again. Go. All right, so we have this virtual service. So let's go through this as well. So we're setting hosts here to star, just like we set it in the gateway resource. So this is the way the matching is being done, right? So what we're saying here is that we could curl to directly to an IP address. Our gateway has a star in there, so it will accept that connection. But our virtual service also has a star, so it will just go through this virtual service. Additionally, if we want to expose a service through the ingress gateway, what we have to do is we have to attach a gateway to a virtual service, right? So these two settings here are basically saying, hey, listen to any host and also attach this gateway to it. So anything that goes through the gateway will end up here. If we wanted to do, uh, typically what you would do is you, you don't wanna use the IP address. So you're gonna use hello.com. You're gonna use a domain. So then what you would do is in the hosts on your gateway, instead of putting star there, you could do hello.com. And then similarly in the virtual service, you would do hello.com here as well. So that way you have a match from hosts in the gateway resource to the hosts in the one or more virtual services that have hello.com as well. And the fact that it's attached to the gateway, it will let the traffic uh, through. Finally, under the HTTP section, this is just a very simple rule uh, route that's saying route all the requests that come in, route them to this host, which is the Kubernetes service. It's a fully qualified domain name for the Kubernetes service and the port 80. So let's apply this one. There you go. So the service was created. And then we can also list it, list the virtual service. And we see that we have one virtual service that has this gateway attached and it's listening for all hosts. So what can we do now? Well, we can go and say gateway, gateway IP. We can curl to gateway IP. And you'll notice that this time we actually get a response back. Uh, if I just do the actual external IP address, and I'll just open it in another, um, and in our window, you'll notice that we actually get the web front end, right? This is the web front end web page. Um, and what it does, it just calls the customer's service. That, that's the other service that we have running. And it just displays the JSON list that it gets back. So this is pretty much it. Like Ingress gateways are fairly, they're fairly straightforward once you understand how it works. And um, the key is to actually understanding the host filtering and how the hosts work. And then once you have that figure out, you could do, uh, let me just list the gate gateway. Uh, let's do gateway YAML. Uh, oh, gateway. There you go. So once you have this, then you can tack on the, uh, Let's say you want to do the TLS termination, right? You want to do, you want to have HTTPS, right? How do you do that? Well, you go, you get your certificates, you take or bring those certificates inside of your cluster. And then the only thing you have to do is to say, 
hey, uh, whenever there's a request for hello.com host, I wanted to use this credential, this uh, certificate, and then you just point to the Kubernetes service where your SSL cert is. So question, uh, so a virtual service is the glue that connects the gateway to the Kubernetes service. Is that correct? Does that mean that every Kubernetes service needs a virtual service in front of it? Uh, yes and yes, you can, yeah, glue is a good, a good word because you are combining them together uh, and every Kubernetes service needs a virtual service. Typically, if they're part of the mesh, yes, it's a good practice to have it because that's what it, that's what configures, right? The combination of the gateway and the virtual services actually is what configures the Envoy proxies next to your uh, workloads that are running there. That's how you, that's, that's what drives the Envoy configuration, right? That virtual service. All right. Uh, I think that was my part, right, Aiton? I, I, did I miss anything? Yes. No, you got it. <laughs> and uh, that brings us to about uh, halfway through our workshop. Uh, we've got about an hour left. If you guys want to take uh, five minutes, stretch your legs, grab a cup of coffee, yeah. this is probably a good time to do it. I'm, uh, I'm maybe going to begin with uh, just recapping uh, Closing out that ingress uh, conversation so we can talk about observability. Yeah. That's the yeah. next topic. Let, let, let me just answer John's question. He had a, so he basically said, if I didn't have the virtual service, I would just lose out on feature. Like, yeah, you, not lose out. You won't be able to do those, right? Because the way to do those, uh, uh, those features is by defining them and specifying them in the virtual service, right? But the routing will still work, right? If you if you have, if you want to route from, let's say web front end to customer, uh, I mean, you've noticed we haven't defined a, I don't think we've defined a virtual service for um, for our customers. Well, the customer's back end, right? right. And it, so it still works. worked, right? So the front end was able to call customer service, but later on when we do like version two or something, then you have to have a virtual service in order to actually define these, uh, 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 define these features, right? If you want to use them. Uh, yeah. First gateway in a virtual service can be created and used in an environment not using Istio. No. So virtual service and the actual like gateway resource are something that you get with Istio. Um, if you want to clarify your question, um, there's also a more specific one for having multiple zones. Should I create? So let's say I have two zones, star.abc.com and star.xyz.com. Should I create two gateways uh, for this purpose? Should I have two? The no, you don't have to. You can if you want to, uh, but you don't have to. That's the whole, let me, let me share my screen again, just really quickly, um, just to explain this. Uh, Let's open an editor and then I'll I want to make your phone size a little bigger. Yes. Yeah. Let me just okay. Good. Okay. So I'll I'll copy this gateway configuration here. Right. So someone was asking, well, let's say I have abc.com, right? And then you want to have XYZ or whatever, right? You could do this, right? You could easily do this. There's no problem, right? Now, if you want to do, uh, and let's say you send a request to hello.abc.com, oh, hello.abc.com, and then you have curl hello.xyz. I'm so bad at naming things. Uh, so let's say these are the two requests that you have, and then there's a backing Kubernetes service called hello-abc, right? And then you have another backing service called hello-xyz, right? So that's... When you call this, you want to end up at this Kubernetes service, which has their own pods, right? Whatever. So how do you do this? You configure your ingress gateway like this. You're saying, hey, I'm listening to all the combinations and variations of these hosts. But then in the virtual service, what you would do is, I'm just going to paste this here. So you would say, hey, for anything that's abc.com, I want to attach the front end gateway to it. But then I want to run my traffic to, what do we say? Hello dash abc dot uh, default dot cluster dot SCC, whatever the fully qualified name is, right? So we do this for your ABC service, right? And then you would have another virtual service that says, well, this one is for XYZ, right? So we say star XYZ, and this one goes to XYZ, right? 
So you basically have a single gateway, single ingress gateway, single gateway resource, if you wish, both listening on port 80, four different hosts. And then once the request comes in here, what gateway does or uh, what happens beneath the, like under the covers is this, the, the request that, uh, the host that a request came in on is going to get matched to any virtual services that potentially match that host, right? And if that's found, that's where the request is going to go, right? Yes, the SSL termination is on the gateway as well. So over here, you would do, assuming you have one host, right? You would do, uh, I don't remember what the, what the actual, okay. So it's there's, just, there's a link in the lab. It's just TLS. Yeah, that's what I'm looking that for. TLS, it. right? Most yeah. simple. And then credential name, my Kubernetes secret, right? That's it, right? Yeah. That, that's how you would do the termination there as well, right? So, yeah. So that's what I'm saying. This The TLS is... It's typically it can be a big, like people have a lot of issue with it. Oh, how do I do this? And everything. But it's extremely straightforward. Now, I'm not talking about the part, how do you actually bring in your secret to the cluster, right? There's multiple, you can use cert manager, you can do it manually, et cetera. It's multiple, multiple ways to do that, right? But once you have your credentials in Kubernetes cluster, it's fairly straightforward. This is how you then just say, point to it, uh, uh, point to that specific credential that has the key and the certificate. All right. Uh, yes. Let me, let me stop sharing again. Sorry if we went a little bit. Um, yeah. Hopefully that was useful. No, I'm glad that we're taking time to answer questions. All right. Thank you, Peter. We have one quick question that I don't know if was addressed by Salman. When to okay. use a multiple gateway and one virtual service? Ah, yes. Um, okay. So one, uh, sort of other technology I like to bring into the conversation because I know a lot of folks are familiar with it. Uh, you know, with Kubernetes, you have the concept of a service and there's there's a load balancer type service, a cluster IP type service. And the problem with load balancer service is it's not really scalable. You can't have one for every single workload you want to expose. And so the, the, the initial solution to that problem was what we call the ingress resource, right? So many folks are probably familiar with the Nginx ingress controller or Contour, or there are a number of different products that support the ingress uh, Kubernetes CRD. And by the way, Istio does too. So Istio can serve as your ingress controller. But what we just went through is essentially a design, which in my opinion is a little bit superior. So, so why do I bring that up? It's because a single uh, Istio ingress gateway can handle uh, a lot of different host names. You can have multiple domain names. Uh, so the question is, well, do I need more than one? Uh, not necessarily, but can I have more than one? Yes, absolutely. And so sometimes there are situations where you, maybe for security reasons or what have you, where you might not want a shared model for ingress where everything going through a single load balancer, in which case you can deploy the Istio ingress component individually on its own. And you can deploy it. It's, it's like a separate installation of Istio on the same Kubernetes cluster, but it's not because it's, it's just that ingress component. And so by doing that, you can actually have a second or a third sort of dedicated ingress gateway yes. if you yeah. want to make it separate. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But, but, but you don't have to, right? That's the whole point. You can use one, That's the whole you point. can host yeah. how ma as many uh, services or domain names, if you, if you talk about it that way or zones, right? Um, or you can create more uh, gateways, right? One, one scenario where you could do like, where I would think you might have two of them is you can have like an internal only ingress gateway, for example, right? That's not exposed to the outside That's... as well, right? That's where you can separate it, yeah. Yeah, and, and I'm gonna ask, uh, I know this is interesting and it could by itself be a topic that could fill the whole workshop, but we got so much more to show you. So I'm gonna try to speed forward if, <laughs> with, with uh, due respect. Uh, all right, so where are we right now? We've got essentially uh, a gateway IP address, right? That we can actually go to, we can curl or bring up in a, in a, in a web browser and we should be able to see our application, which is great, right? We're, and it didn't take us much, right? We just installed Istio, deployed the applications, configured a couple of custom resources and this picture has been realized. So this is, in my mind, where a lot of the fun begins because um, now we can start looking at some of the things you get in exchange for 
onboarding your workloads on a service mesh. And the first one we're going to explore is observability, uh, which uh, from a problem statement, statement point of view is, uh, is really important in that when you go to cloud native, when you have 100,000 services, how do you make sense of what goes on in your mesh? It, because the picture becomes really, really complex. You know, all these things that used to be in a single process, like a stack trace, with, we used to complain about having really long stack traces. Uh, uh, now sort of traded uh, with uh, maybe shorter stack traces, but a lot of calls between services. And that gives the rise to the need for something we call distributed tracing, which is has now a component of observability. So the picture you're staring at uh, shows our two familiar services, A and B, web front end and customers with those envoys. And those envoys turn out to be almost what I like to call natural cleavage points. Uh, in the whole um, communication path of your uh, entire system. That is, every time a call from A to B happens, Envoy not only figures out how to forward the traffic to the right destination, but it also collects metrics. And those metrics are exposed to Prometheus through a scrape endpoint. So development teams typically used to have to bundle into their application extra endpoints for observability. Here you see a situation where uh, that responsibility is taken off the development team's shoulders and that sidecar takes care of it for us. We're going to take a look. Likewise, those envoys can send samples of traces to a Zipkin backend that collects all these traces and gives you a means of visualizing calls in your service mesh. Uh, and that becomes really, really powerful. And in a very similar fashion, we can also have those envoys stream our logs to some back end, you know, some logging uh, sync where our logs can get indexed and become searchable and we get some, some dashboard that allows us to search our logs. So uh, having this uh, architecture solves the observability problem. And so uh, without further ado, let's explore. Let's see what we can do with... Um, observability. So we've got this lab and this lab, the first thing you're going to have to do, of course, is install the observability tools, which are actually bundled. Uh, the manifest files for Prometheus, uh, Grafana, Kiali, and Zipkin are all bundled with, with Istio. And so that's probably the place to start. If you go and look in your Istio folder, you'll see a folder called samples add-ons. And in there, you'll see these YAML files. So step one is let's apply Grafana YAML. Let's apply uh, Prometheus YAML, and these uh, get deployed to the Istio system namespace. And we're going to apply also uh, two more Kiali, and we're going to apply, I think, under extras is a Zipkin add on. We can also, we could have picked Jaeger, but I'm a little more familiar with Zipkin. All right, so by applying these, uh, we have essentially all of our uh, sort of observability tools or dashboards available. Uh, if we look at our pods in the Istio system namespace, you should see these things coming up. There's Kiali and there's Grafana and Prometheus. And um, maybe we'll start with Kiali. I think that's what the lab has you do. So, but before we can observe traffic running through our mesh, we have a conundrum. And the conundrum is that um, there's no traffic in our mesh, right? So we need to generate a load. And uh, the lab will walk you through the instructions to actually install um, Siege, which is one of a number of alternative uh, load testing tools, uh, and uh, use Siege to send some traffic to our mesh. So uh, if I've, I've gone ahead and already installed Siege, if you haven't, uh, you can just follow these simple six steps here to download, untar, configure, make, and make install. You'll have Siege installed in your, on your machine. I'm going to run the Siege command. And that command is going to send a very light load, about uh, one, one or two requests per second, to uh, our gateway IP address. Notice I'm leveraging my gateway IP environment variable uh, in, in that request. So uh, I like to leave it running and open another tab. So uh, this is going to run for about 20 minutes, which should be plenty of time for me to start showing you some of the observability features. So first thing first. Uh, if you run, there's a command called Istio Cuddle Dashboard. And if you run the help command on it, you'll see that there's a number of dashboards you can look at. And the first one we'll look at is the Kiali Dashboard. Istio Cuddle Dashboard Kiali. 
And uh, sometimes uh, in these environments, you might get a fail to open browser, but it's easy enough to remedy that. You just click on that link and, uh, and then your Kiali dashboard will show up. All right, and, and the thing that stands out most in this, Kiali is, by the way, if you want to check out Kiali, it calls itself the console for the Istio service mesh. So think of it as a GUI for Istio. And the thing that stands out the most is this graph. Uh, Kiali will draw these uh, uh, graphs of, of essentially traffic taking place inside your service mesh in real time. This is, uh, this is what's happening right now. If I were to kill Siege right now, what would happen is that uh, this graph would sort of uh, disappear, it would go away. So here we can actually see how requests make their, make their way from the ingress gateway to the web front end, to the customer's back end. And there's, uh, so you might have to pick the, the namespace that you want to observe. So that would be the default namespace. So if that checkbox is not checked, you can go ahead and check it. Uh, there are different kinds of graphs. If you care about version numbers, the version app graph is a good one. Uh, the app graph removes the version numbers. Uh, you can also display, uh, there's something called a traffic visualization, which I like very much. Let's see if I can find, where is that? Uh, traffic animation, rather. And uh, there's also a security uh, checkbox I can turn on. Uh, and, and now I can actually see a couple of things. Uh, notice that each one of those arrows is green, which means that those requests return HTTP 200. So they're successful. There are no failures. We also see lock icons in this picture. We can turn on the legend as well if we want to understand what all of these different icons mean. Um, and uh, that means we've got mutual TLS taking place even inside our mesh. So this is security in depth, right? And, and then the traffic animation shows that uh, the relative uh, frequency of requests to different services. So it's more frequent to the web front end. I think it's because it's also serving CSS files or maybe JavaScript files in addition to uh, making calls to the back end service. Uh, so that's Kiali in a nutshell. And I'm, I apologize for sort of flying through this because there's too much, um, it feels like there's too much to show. Uh, but so I'm going to close Kiali and let you explore that on your own time and go on to the next dashboard. Now the next dashboard is, uh, is Prometheus. So let me scroll down to, uh, no, Zipkin is the next one, sorry. So let's go and look at Zipkin. It's the Ocuddle dashboard Zipkin. It's just that easy to, to set up uh, access to your dashboard. Now, you know, you might want to set up something uh, more permanent, uh, you know, if you install this in an environment where you want a population of operators to look through it. But we were looking for traces involving one of our services. Now, this trace we're interested in involves all of them. So it doesn't really matter what we pick there. So we pick a service name. And I'm, what I'm seeing is sample traces that have been collected by our envoys and sent to Zipkin. And so Zipkin can actually show us, I'm gonna pick this one, uh, a distributed trace. Now this distributed trace is not too interesting because we only have two services, but you can actually see exactly what we saw with Kiali, the call from the ingress gateway to the web front end and from the web front end to the customer's back end. And these blue uh, bars are basically time durations, how much time is spent inside each service as it's handling the request, maybe waiting on a response from another service before finally sending its response back to the caller. And you see a bunch of metadata here on the right-hand side as well. And you can also drill down. You could double click on one of these and just focus on a, a leaf or a subset of your tree, so to speak. So that's uh, Zipkin in a nutshell is really helpful. It's almost like a stack trace for developers to diagnose latency and other issues, um, but it actually, its scope now has grown to be a distributed trace that spans multiple microservices. All right, let's go on and look at uh, Prometheus next. And what's interesting about Prometheus is we can actually use the Istio cuddle dashboard command in a slightly uh, different way. We can look at the Envoy dashboard for one of our uh, deployments. So if I look at the sidecar for the customer service, okay, we get the admin dashboard for Envoy, the one that's running alongside the customer service. And notice that one of the endpoints is called Stats Prometheus. And what you're seeing here, this is the Prometheus scrape endpoint that Prometheus itself uses to grab metrics uh, periodically by going to these endpoints. So imagine uh, Prometheus actually making calls to all of your services to grab these metrics to store in its time series database. 
Uh, so that's what we're doing here. So we've got a Prometheus endpoint that's exposed. And all we have to do now is take a look at the Prometheus dashboard. Uh, now, Prometheus is really more of a database. It's, and, it, but it's, and as a database, it also has its own custom query language called PromQL. So those of you who are familiar with Prometheus are probably familiar with PromQL. And now there's a lot of different metrics we can look at. One of them is called Istio requests total. And I can sort of throw that expression in this text field and click on execute. And then you get the search results. Uh, you can also look at that as a graph. So what we're looking at here is total requests in our mesh, either you know from to, to the ingress gateway or to the customer service, the web front end. And because this is a counter, you see that value sort of monotonically increasing over time. Uh, but it's hard to make sense of all of this information. Now, what are all, what's all of this text that we see here at the bottom? Uh, this is essentially what Prometheus calls dimensional metrics. It's a bunch of extra metadata that makes your metrics queryable. So we're looking for requests that have a response code of 200. We can actually say, uh, give, show me all um, values for this metrics where the request is from a source app that uh, is, happens to be the web front end, for example, right? So you can, this query language is rather powerful. Uh, another thing you can do is you can say, what's the rate of these requests over time, over a five minute period, for example. Uh, and I think I've got that wrong. Let me copy the actual, here we go. Let me grab this guy. So, uh, oh, I think that comma shouldn't have been there. Yeah, so if I just remove that comma, that should work. There we go. So we can see here, this value is stabilizing. The rate is about two requests per second. So that's uh, kind of a quick bird's eye view of Prometheus. And uh, I think the best way to look at the data from Prometheus is to actually look at Grafana, right? So Grafana leverages uh, the metrics from Prometheus. So does Kiali, by the way. To, uh, and, and one of the things that becomes clear by looking at Grafana is the fact that Istio gives you this consistency and uniformity across your mesh. Those metrics are the same for all your services and the dashboards can be built only once for all your services. So if I wanna look at my mesh uh, from a very high level point of view, what's the total number, what's the global request volume? What's the global success rate? Number of 404s or 400 responses, number of gateways. Uh, here we see again, uh, the same sort of information, latency and so on across multiple services. Uh, your development teams don't have to build their own dashboards. And that's powerful. Uh, so what you see here is essentially a whole folder with multiple types of dashboards that are pre-built for you in advance. There's a service dashboard. You can look at the customer service, for example, and look at general metrics, request volume, success rates, request durations. And uh, you can even look at outbound requests for, for example, I'm going to look at, um, there's a particular dashboard here called the workload dashboard. Yeah. And uh, we can look at outbound services for the for the uh, web front end. And you can actually see those requests coming out of web front end and into the customer service. So um, maybe I'll make that a little bit bigger. So there you see those requests making their way to the customer service outbound from the web front end. So very, very rich dashboards that, and more importantly, that are uniform across all your services running in the mesh. All right, so that was sort of a quick whirlwind tour of all of these uh, dashboards and the wealth of observability you get with Istio. Uh, I don't wanna to spend too much time, I wanna sort of give you as much time as possible to explore and to go through this lab and to run these dashboard commands yourself and to see this in action, maybe even to poke at particular areas that you might be interested in. Uh, and that's, that's observability in a nutshell. Uh, we are going to, I'm going to look at questions and hand it back to, uh, to Peter. So I'll just go in and I'll just start talking about security a little bit. Uh, we have a lab as well, but I think for the sake of time, I'll just go through the slides and then Ethan, I think we should just go to the traffic routing instead uh, and just show that demo. Uh, otherwise, we'll, we, we're not going to have time. All right. So uh, so authentication or auth n um, is all about the principle, um, or since we're talking about services, it's all about the services identity. 
And then when we say we're performing authentication, what we're doing is we're validating some sort of a credential and then ensuring that that credential is valid and trusted. So once the authentication succeeds, then we can talk about an authenticated principle. Now, if the credential is not valid or we um, uh, or it can be trusted, uh, we can then say that we're talking about unauthenticated principle or in case we didn't have a principle, uh, there's nothing to authenticate. Now, and a good example of authentication is when you're traveling and you have to present your passport or an ID to the customs uh, officer. So they're the ones that are gonna authenticate your password or ID and ensure that it's valid and trusted. In Kubernetes, each workload gets assigned a unique identity. And this identity is then used when the workloads communicate with each other. Now, this identity in Kubernetes takes the form of the Kubernetes service account. Uh, the service account is the identity that pods will use and then present at runtime. Yes, the labs will be available. They're always available uh, after the uh, after the talk as well. So what Istio does is Istio uses the X509 certificate from that service account, and then it creates a new identity according to the spec that's called Spiffy. Spiffy stands for Secure Production Identity Framework for Everyone. So what Spiffy does is it describes the following. It describes a naming convention that's universal and it's based on a URI. So it's just a path. And then it describes how to how can you take that identity and how can you encode it into different documents? And the one that we care about is the X509 certificate. And then the guarantee that Spiffy makes is when you create that X509 certificate and you fill in these specific fields in specific ways, and if you do that, then when you do a normal certificate validation, if you do a extra step, one more extra step while you're validating that certificate, then you can authenticate the identity inside the certificate. So Spiffy says you have X509 and you handle it in this specific way and you authenticate it in the standard way. And once you, or after you've authenticated it in the standard way, you also check the subject alternate name in the certificate. Then you have a valid Spiffy identity and it is an authenticated principle. So at runtime, we can take these certificates and we can do mutual TLS. So the Envoy proxies are modified in such a way that when they do the TLS handshake, they do that extra bit that's required by the Spiffy validation. Um, and then those authenticated principles, both at the source and the destinations, are available to apply policies to or create policies with. So now that you have these identities, um, you can use them at runtime to do mutual TLS. So what is mutual TLS? Uh, traditionally, uh, TLS is done one way. So you go to the browser, you go to uh, google.com, you'll see that lock. And then if you click at that padlock or that icon, uh, you'll look at the certificate and you have all that information, right? However, when I typed google.com, I didn't actually give Google any proof of my identity, right? I just made a request. And this is where mutual TLS is fundamentally different. So when two services try to communicate with mutual TLS, it is required that both of them provide certificate to each other. So both parties know who they're talking to. So mutual TLS is great and you should have it turned on for all of your services. However, there might be scenarios where you have some legacy applications. They're not supporting mutual TLS yet. And there's also the timing problem. So let's suppose you want to um, enable mutual TLS across all of your deployments, right? You're gonna run into chicken and egg problem if you want to do the mutual TLS because the connection will either be mutual TLS or not, it'll be plain text. Now the client that's connecting to the server via mutual TLS where the server is not accepting mutual TLS, that's not gonna work. And then the opposite, where the, service is, the server is attempting to serve mutual TLS and the client wants plain text, that's not gonna work either. So that means if you, if you want to enable mutual TLS, what you have to do is you have to redeploy your client and servers in a coordinated manner at the same time 
this is impossible. Uh, uh, <laughs> you can't do that reliably. And even if you somehow did it, uh, it's not going to be repeatable. Now, luckily for us, Istio has this graceful mode uh, where you can opt into mutual TLS. And this mode is called the permissive mode. This is enabled by default when you install Istio. And once it's enabled, if a client tries to connect to the server via mutual TLS, the server will serve mutual TLS. Now, if the client doesn't use mutual TLS, the server can respond with plain text as well. So you're basically permitting the client to decide whether they want to do mutual TLS. So using this mode, you can then gradually roll out mutual TLS across your whole mesh. So for your servers, you can turn on the permissive mode and then provision the certificates. And then if a client wants to do mutual TLS, it will be accepted. And same with uh, if they don't want to do mutual TLS. Then you can go to your clients, gradually roll out mutual TLS there. Uh, and you can do that per service and then gradually opt in your services. Once you move everything over, uh, then you can remove this permissive mode and set it to strict. So strict is just saying, I can only do mutual TLS. So if the client tries to connect, uh, they will have to do mutual TLS and they will have to present their certificate. So this brings us to the first resource uh, in Istio. It's called peer authentication. So this resource controls the communication between the workloads. Using the peer authentication resource, you can configure mutual TLS mode that's used when the workloads communicate. As mentioned, default is set to permissive. Um, however, you can also set it to strict. Additionally, you can also control the mutual TLS mode at the mesh level. So you can configure permissive or strict mode across the whole mesh or in specific namespaces, or you can even go more granular and say, uh, you can use labels to set the mutual TLS for only specific workloads. Now, if that's not enough, you can also then control uh, mutual TLS at the port level. So you can set up uh, strict mutual TLS for some workloads, but then disable mutual TLS for communication on only that, for communication that happens on specific ports only. Just a couple of examples. Here's how you can set the strict mode uh, in the default name, uh, in the full namespace, right? You're just setting it to strict for all the workloads in that namespace. A similar one, but here you're setting strict mode to workloads with a specific label set. You can do that with the match labels and the selector. And then if you want to do it to the port level, uh, uh, at the port level, you can set the strict mode for all workloads, but then disable mutual TLS for, let's say, port 5000. So this is all about services and how services communicate. How about users? How can you authenticate users in Istio? So this is where request authentication uh, research comes in. And this is the resource that's used for end user authentication. And what it does, it verifies the credentials that are attached to the request. The request level authentication is done with JSON web tokens. So just like we use Spiffy identity to authenticate the services, to authenticate the users, we can use the JWT or JWT tokens. So Here's a sample resource, right? This request uh, authentication resource is uh, applies to all the workloads in the default namespace that have the app HTTP bin label set. So any request that's made to these workloads will need a JWT token. So the request authentication resource will configure how uh, uh, wh what is the issuer of the token and uh, if the signature is authenticated using the provided key set in the JOT URIs, uh, uh, JOT key URIs field. So if the request to the selected workloads does not contain a valid JOT token, uh, that's the token that doesn't conform to these rules, the request will be rejected. Now, on the other hand, if you don't provide a token at all, the request will not be authenticated. So let's assume we have authenticated the request. Uh, once we have that, then we can talk about the second part of the original access control question, which is performing an action on an object. So this is what authorization is about. So just like the peer authentication, the request authentication can also be scoped at uh, mesh namespace and the workload level. 
You can also configure request authentication at the ingress level. So you can do that by just specifying Istio ingress gateway label, for example. Um, so if you do that at the edge, but then you want to perform any additional JWT token logic, for example, you want to uh, apply authorization policies inside your mesh, you can then use forward original token field, uh, set it to true, and then we'll pass the original token to your uh, service, to the upstream services services inside, uh, inside your mesh. So what Istio does, it's going to take this configuration and then translate it into um, Envoy config. Uh, I'm going to skip this over because this is just an Envoy configuration, uh, uh, how it looks like inside the Envoy configuration. Um, these filters will check for multiple things to verify the token or just uh, if, if, if there's mismatching issuers or if the token expired, if the audience is invalid, etc then the request will be denied. However, the request will be approved if there's a valid JWT token or if you don't provide any either. That's why you have to use the authorization policy. So authorization is just answering the access control portion, which is, is an authenticated principle allowed to perform an action on an object? So can a user A send a get request to slash hello on service A? Now the principle could be authenticated. However, it might not be allowed to perform an action. An example here is your uh, company ID card might be valid and authentic. However, you won't be able to use it to enter offices of a different company, right? Or if we continue with the, the customs officer metaphor from before, we could say authorization is similar to a visa stamp in your passport maybe. So this brings us to the next point having authentication without authorization and vice versa, that doesn't help you much. So for proper access control, you have to have both. So if you only authenticate the principles and you don't authorize them, they can do whatever they want and they can perform any actions on any objects. And then the other way around, if you authorize a, uh, authorize a request, but you don't authenticate it, then I can pretend to be someone else and I can still perform any actions on any objects. So once you have the authenticated principle, we can then decide how you want to restrict access based on that. And to do that, this is where the authorization policy comes in. So the authorization policy makes use of the principle from the peer authentication and the principle from the request authentication. Remember, peer is services, request is users. So if we're trying to write the policies based on the peer or service identities, we can use the principles field. And if you're making decisions based on the users, we would use the request principles. So here's an example. Um, this example is gonna apply the authorization policy to all workloads that match the app app colon prod label. And then the second part of the resource is where we're defining the rules. And here's where we're saying that we are allowing calls from a source that has any request principle set. Note that we aren't checking for any specific principle here, but just that the principle is set. Now with this authorization policy and the request authentication policy, we are guaranteeing that only authenticated principles or requests will reach the prod workloads in this case. The previous examples are fairly simple, but there are multiple ways you can write the rules. Uh, you have the from field where you can define the list of source identities, namespaces, or principles that are allowed to call the services we are applying the policy to. Um, there's also like all these sources, the principles, request principles, namespaces, IP blocks also have negative matches, right? So you could say not principles or not namespace uh, namespaces to include a list of negative matches. The second field is the to field. And this is where you specify what paths or what methods, ports or host uh, hosts can be used when making the calls to the service. So this example shows that we can call the uh, delete method on the slash logs path, and then call the get method on slash data paths and ports 3000 and 5000 on uh, requests that are sent from the request.host. So that's just the request.host will resolve the actual host name. So just like with the form uh, field, you can also do negative matches here and do not methods, not paths, not hosts as well.
Finally, uh, the when field or the condition allows you to specify different conditions based on the attributes from the request itself. So things like headers, a source or remote IP, namespaces, principles, destinations, uh, destination ports and IPs, connections to SNI, and, so more, uh, and, and, and more. So this example shows that you can only make the calls from and to when the request has a valid JOT token that, would, that was issues, issued by accounts.google.com. And when my header, uh, header contains that specific value and the request is coming from the full namespace. So once you have all that, uh, we can then configure the action. So you can write all those rules. And then you can also say, well, I want to either allow it or deny it based on those rules. Uh, the two additional uh, actions here are custom and audit. So custom is when you want to specify your own custom extension to handle the requests. And then the audit is uh, you would use audit to audit a request that matches the rules. So if any request matches the rules, the audit action would then trigger logging that request. So this action will not affect where whether the requests are allowed or denied, only deny allowing custom actions uh, do that. So an example scenario where you could use the audit action is when you're, let's say, migrating your workloads from permissive to strict, right? And then if, if none of those things match, then you can audit and log that and go and uh, look it up later. So just to recap very quickly, uh, first is the services, their identity. Services get their identity through the X509 certificates in Kubernetes. That's from the service accounts. The peer authentication resource is used to control the communication between the services. This is where you can set mutual TLS mode to permissive or strict. Now, once the services are authenticated, certain metadata about the services is stored, and then you can use that later to enforce access control. So things like uh, the principal name. Second thing are users. So to authenticate users with JWT tokens, you can use the request authentication resource. Once you're, you've authenticated the users, the information from the JOT tokens can then be used to perform uh, access control. Finally, once you have the authenticated principle, that could be either service or a user, then you can use the authorization policy to create the rules that specify which services can call the workloads, which paths and methods can be used, as well as under what conditions. So for the sake of time, I'm not gonna go through the lab. However, that lab is there and it will show you how to enable mutual TLS. And it will also show you how you can use the um, authorization policy to only allow calls from the front end to, uh, from the Istio Ingress gateway to the front end and from the front end to the customers. And none of the other combinations will work. So that's in the lab. Um, I'll hand it off to Ethan so he can go through the traffic management next. So uh, I think, yeah, for the sake of time, we're going to fast forward to the traffic shifting lab. Uh, but I think we have a couple of minutes just to walk you through at least uh, the instructions here in terms of what you're going to do. Uh, if you, if you want to do this on your own time after the workshop is over. Uh, the first exercise is rather interesting. It has you create a namespace. And I'm just going to talk th through it. Uh, that's not labeled for sidecar injection on purpose so that if we deploy like a, another pod to that namespace, it won't have a sidecar. And if it doesn't have a sidecar, that means that that uh, communication from it to other services will not use mutual TLS because there's no sidecar to upgrade that, uh, that communication. And so the, the exercise here is to just make a call to the customer service from a uh, sort of a non-service mesh uh, client and see whether it succeeds or fails. And that's actually very, very easy to, to run through. Uh, you know, you do a K create NS, other NS, K apply dash F uh, dash N, other NS um, artifacts. Yeah, artifacts sleep. Okay, so we're, we're and notice uh, if we look at the pods in that namespace, we don't have a sidecar. See that column ready says one out of one. So now if I do an exec from that uh, from that pod uh, to the customer service in the default namespace, it succeeds, and that's what we call permissive mode. So you imagine the receiving customer service envoy 
receiving plain text traffic and saying, okay, I'm going to allow that. How do we make that strict? We basically do something like this. We say peer authentication mode strict for all services in the default namespace. You could do it mesh wide if you use the namespace Istio system, which is called the root namespace. So if I just apply artifacts and TLS strict, and I just repeat that exec call, notice that that request is no longer allowed. So that's strict mode mutual TLS. So that's the first part of that lab. Uh, the second part is the authorization policy, which is also kind of fun. Uh, so now that we can no longer call from another namespace without mutual TLS into a customer service, we could still do it from the sleep pod in the default namespace, because that one does have a sidecar, right? And, um, and that works. And maybe we don't want that to work. And we can control that through an authorization policy. So if we look at the authorization policy, uh, this is the perfect example. It says, by the way, the customer service, which matches this selector, you should allow requests from uh, sources that match this value. And that's the spiffy identity of the web front end service, it's, which is derived from its namespace and service account. So all you have to do is something like k okay, apply that you have uh this authorization policy and then if we just retry let's rerun that execute uh, from the sleep pod a call to the customer service notice we get an access deny so that's just an example of the application of a uh, of an authorization policy and we can do the same thing for the uh web front end to uh to uh from the ingress gateway to the web front end uh so and we could still verify that this you know this this endpoint has been unaffected by the application of that authorization policy because this one is actually going through the, the allowed path. <laughs> All right, so that was the security lab. We like to end this, uh, this workshop with kind of a fun one. And this is really a, almost like a canonical example in my mind uh, of traffic shifting. This is the thing that's probably most visible when you talk about Istio is the, the, the fact that you can control traffic so precisely, right? And I'm going to show you how to do that through an example whereby uh, our, say our development team has developed a version two of the customer service and we want to deploy it and we want to deploy it safely, right? So this is the beginning of that story and let's do it together, let's see. Uh, so if we look at our pods, we have a web front end and a customer service and a sleep pod, which we can ignore for now. And uh, notice customers is customers D1. Now, if we look at the services, and if we look at the wide output, the selector on the services service is app equals customers, which obviously uh, is going to match any pods that are customer app. If we were to deploy right now another version, and we do have one in, uh, in our artifacts folder, it's called customers v2.yaml. This is version two. Notice the image is uh, tagged with 2.0, supposedly. If we were to deploy it right now, it also has that app equals customers label on line seven. So that means that it would start receiving 50% of traffic immediately. We don't want that. We want to divorce the deployment of a new version of our application uh, from uh, routing traffic to it. And with Istio, we can do exactly that. And the way we do it is through the application of a new custom resource called a destination rule. And it looks something like this. Let's look at the customer's destination rule. Where is destination rule? There is a YAML file by that name. And all this YAML says, and this could almost like uh, it, it reads without any effort, without really knowing a priori what, what this vocabulary is. It basically says, by the way, as far as the customer service goes, Istio, you should know there are two subsets. There are two versions. There's going to be a V1, there's going to be a V2. And the way that you can tell them apart is by looking at another label, the version label. So if it says version V1, that's the V1 subset, and version V2, that's the V2 subset. If we apply this, the customer's destination rule, we're essentially giving more information to Istio. We're saying, Istio, you should be able to discriminate between V1 and V2. Now that we've got that in there, we can look at another piece of uh, manifest file called the customer's virtual service, I think it's called. And this one essentially says, hey, by the way, we've seen virtual services before where we did ingress, right, to route traffic to the web front end. This is internal traffic inside the mesh. We're saying, hey, when requests are made by anybody to the customer service, route them all to the V1 subset. Okay, so if we apply that, 
Um, now we're in a position where we can safely deploy version two without any traffic being sent to it. So if I do a k apply dash f artifact customers v2.yaml, and we look at our pods, I'll wait for that pod to come up. Okay, so customers v2 should be running in just a moment after the pod finishes initializing and it downloads the image and so on. Um, then we can actually ask ourselves, well, how do we know that all the traffic is going to v1, right? I don't know why this is taking so long. Uh, okay, okay, get yeah. pod. All right, there we go. Okay, so it's ready. I could look at the logs. I could say k logs, right? Uh, customer is v1, follow. Uh, sh sure enough, v1 is getting a lot of traffic, and we could do k logs, uh, customer is v2, follow. And here we see nothing, right? So good, our policy seems to be working. But you know what? We've got these rich observability tools that we can use to see what goes on, right? So um, why not make a, take advantage of them? We could do an Istio Cuddle dashboard, Kiali. Right? And we can open Kiali. And we should be able to see in our graph whether requests are going to be one or v2. And notice v2 is not even present in this picture because it's receiving no traffic. All right, so the next thing developers uh, probably want to do is test their application in production first before end users have a chance to do that. So we could do that with a modified virtual service. Let me show you what that looks like. I like to call it uh, debug mode or something. Uh, we could look at the artifacts folder. There is a customer's um, customers v2 debug is what it's called. Notice what this says. On line nine, it says, by the way, oh, line 10, match headers. If there is a header, and I just made this up, user agent equals debug, then route everything over to, D, to v2. But if there is no such special header, route everything back to v1. Uh, now, how do I tell V2 apart from V1? V2 returns a little more information about customers, not just their names, but also their cities. And when you when you look at the at this page, you'll see a two column output when you're making a call to V2. All right. So if I were to apply this virtual service, the words V2 debug. What I'm essentially saying is all requests should go to v1, except in situations where I modify my user agent to debug, in which case it should uh, route that request to v2. So I have complete control over routing based on all kinds of header values or what have you. If I just remove this, this is a mod header extension, by the way. It's nice. It's a nice extension that you can use to add custom headers when you make requests from a web browser. It's very, very useful. All right, so that works. Uh, and uh, I could turn that on one more time, uh, just for uh, for the sake of maybe capturing that for observability. If I just uh, refresh this a few times, okay, and then I'll turn it off again. Uh, then I should be able to go to Kiali and see. Ah, uh, I don't know why. My... Yeah, so here notice that I see some requests going to V1 and V2, and I can actually turn on something called traffic distribution, where I can actually see the percentages. I can see the 90% of traffic is going to V1, and the whatever few requests that I made by refreshing my page are going to V2, and V2 is probably going to collapse and disappear in just a second since I'm not calling it anymore. Uh, all right, so now that I'm satisfied that V2 is, from a functional standpoint, it doesn't have any bugs. Maybe I've run a little test suite against it or, or something like that then I'm ready to start siphoning off traffic to it. So that's the next artifact I want to show you. This is called customers v2 canary because we're doing kind of a canary deployment. And notice here what we're doing. We're saying route to v2 with a weight of 10 and route to v1 with a weight of 90. So it's a 90, 10 uh, split. Maybe I'll change that. Maybe I'll make that uh, 30 and 70, right? So K okay, apply that chef artifact customers v2 canary. And, and now if I were to refresh this page, about 30% of these requests would go to V2 and 70% would go to V1. And then if I were to look at Kiali again, uh, if uh, this should refresh in just a few seconds, here we see the traffic splits beginning to happen and it's gonna stabilize at a 70-30 split. And so the next thing I wanna do as a developer is wanna make sure that the new service doesn't have any performance regression. So how do I do that? I could do an Istio Cuddle dashboard Grafana and start looking at some of my dashboards to determine the health of the new service as it's receiving a trickle of traffic, right? That's the idea anyway. I mean, maybe 30% is, well, in this case, it is a trickle. Uh, so I can look at, for example, the workload dashboard 
for the customer's V2 service. And uh, I can start looking at these graphs. I can look at success rates. I can look at latencies. I can look at request volumes. And I can increase, you know, if, I, if these look good, I can increase the request volume and give it more and more traffic. And, uh, and then safely introduce a new version into production in that way. So uh, this uh, works out rather well. So, uh, so everything looks good, presumably, right? So now I'm going to, maybe I'll go take another look at Kiali. It looks like I've got, yeah, 70% of traffic going to V1. So now I'm maybe ready to switch over all the traffic to V2 and I could edit my virtual service. Uh, I think it's called customers and I could change these weights to uh, 100% or 0% or I can just sort of remove the other destination, send everything over to V2 and now wait for it all to percolate. And I've got my dashboards sort of backing me up, giving me the information I need to make the right decisions. Uh, you know, if this, I can continue monitoring this. Notice that I haven't even undeployed V1. V1 is still there and it's still running. Uh, and everything's, uh, so if Ethan, I need to roll back to it, I can, yeah. yep. Ethan, you haven't shown the coolest feature of Kiali. Click the display and then do the traffic animation. That's the one that I like. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. I should turn there it There you go. You can see the oh, so nice. bubbles flowing. Yeah. Yeah. And I also like the lock, you know, the security one. Oh, yeah, true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah there's a bunch good. There's a bunch more. Yeah. And by the way, I, I noticed you put the, the uh, link in the uh, in the Slack channel. Uh, we did, uh, we had Lucas Ponce from the Kiali project on a uh, live stream that we do called uh, Tech Talks, Tetrate Tech Talks. And uh, he, he shows up all kinds of neat features in yes. there as well. Yeah, yeah. It was surprising how many hidden things that you can discover. <laughs> okay. So guys, uh, ask your questions away. Uh, you have time to work on this next lab. As a matter of fact, even though the workshop's going to end in 10 minutes, you, if you, uh, you know, you've got your Kubernetes cluster, feel free to work on these labs uh, as long as you want and explore these features as long as you want. For those of you to whom we lent a uh, Kubernetes cluster, I won't be tearing those down until uh, maybe six hours from now or so, around nine o'clock uh, central time. So, uh, so you have extra time to explore. And uh, we'll be happy to take questions between now and, uh, and the next uh, nine minutes or so. Hmm. What? Let's see. Why should I use? Okay, and that's answered. That's interesting. Why should I use this to gateway instead of Nginx Ingress Controller? Yeah, that one is. Yeah, and then a follow up question was: Do I miss anything if I change Nginx with Istio Proxy? I'm not. I'm not too familiar with Nginx features, but I mean, yeah, not too familiar. But I think I'm comfortable enough to say that you probably wouldn't lose out. Uh, I think Envoy has a really rich like feature set. Uh, but yeah. yes, I know I am on record saying that right now, but <laughs> so I'm, my, like, I'm not, not familiar with Nginx, but. Okay, so, so it's, it's really the ingress resource in Kubernetes. And, and I, I'll give you my first point of view. What I really, really like about the design of the Istio ingress, as opposed to the uh, Kubernetes ingress resource, is a decoupling of two separate concerns. Notice that with, with Istio, it looks like more work. You have to create both a gateway and a virtual service. But when you think about it, which ports you want to open and what certificates you want to associate with, you know, what host name or what have you, is one concern. And that's a concern that maybe the operator team is really uh, 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 might need to, to handle, or maybe not. Uh, but the routing of the request to a particular service is a separate concern. And Istio separates those two. So in my opinion, it's a cleaner design. And, and the way that I know that it's a good design is that it's been validated because there's an upcoming, it's right now it's an alpha. There's a Kubernetes gateway API standard that's coming out. And uh, that standard is has a very similar design uh, to, to Istio's. And Istio is actually uh, committed to um, to supporting that new uh, new design when it, when it gets finalized. So the, ga the gateway API uh, design, which which you can read about, I'll I'll put the link in in the Slack channel. Yeah, so a couple of people asking about the lab. So this lab web page, this is live. This will stay live. We're not gonna can come back anytime uh, and go through this again. This is something that we use and we do like we do these workshops regularly regularly. So we also keep the page updated uh, and fresh. Uh, whenever you go to it, right? So if 
there's new features that are gonna get added to Istio or anything like that, we'll go and update the uh, update the labs as well. Super. I see another question in the Q and A. Where I struggle with is Istio ingress gateway versus API gateways, <laughs> such as Glowcon. Okay, so that's what. We just, how do you feel? The fall in line together. Oh, that's rather interesting. Yeah, it's it's basically speaks to maybe a certain fragmentation in terms of. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of players in this ingress space, isn't there? That does feel like uh, maybe I, I'm, I'm tempted to say stay tuned. I think there's some announcements that are going to be made at KubeCon or Service MeshCon in May that are going to address that uh, that question. So it's a little bit of a teaser, I know. When to use East-West Gateway? So East-West East, East -West Gateway is typically used when you have uh, in a multi-cluster setup where you have uh, workloads in one cluster and you want them to communicate with the workloads uh, in another cluster. Uh, typically you don't wanna do pod to pod communication. So the way that that gets solved is you install a dedicated gateway called East-West Gateway and all the requests from one cluster uh, will go, if the request is being made from one cluster to another, the request will flow through the uh, through that east-west gateway. So that's when you would use that. There's also, a, if you wanna set it up and see how that's set up, there's, a, a, I think the scripts are in the tools folder. If you download, um, download the SEO, uh, SEO package, I guess. Uh, yeah, I think we have five minutes. I think we, we can hang around for another five minutes uh, if, if anyone has any questions. Also, like we are on that Slack, so feel free to join um, or ask questions whenever. Uh, I think after after SEOCon, um, you can also join our Tetrate community Slack uh, and just get in touch with us. Uh, we're, we're online there. Uh, yeah. yeah. I'm on Twitter, Aton is not on Twitter, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't go to Twitter if you want to reach out to A10. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I'm on LinkedIn and I'm on, yeah. Yes. Uh, and and we do these weekly tech talks on Friday. Yes, so exactly. Yeah, yeah. We, do that. we also have, like, if you want to go through a, uh, like a pre-recorded uh, self-paced version of this training or a very similar training, we, we have an Istio Fundamentals course, which is a free course that... Um, you can go through, I'll just paste a link to our Academy webpage and the Slack. Um, it's like a four or five hour course uh, you can go through. We also have an Envoy Fundamentals course. I know we, we talked a little bit about Envoy, but there's so much to Envoy. Um, and it's yeah. it really opens your eyes. Uh, uh, once you go through Envoy and understand all that, it's like a lot of things make sense even more um, when you go to Istio. All right. Well, that was fun, guys. I, I hope we didn't rush through things too much, but we really tried hard to stay uh, under our allotted time. All right. Bye, everybody. It was fun.